Good morning and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. Lots of uh, new people, uh, and you're welcome as well, too. My name is Roger. I am the teaching pastor here at Uptown Community Church, for those of you who don't know me. But of course, you can just tell I'm so wise that you would know that automatically. We are going to be in the book of Hebrews just for uh, one more week after this. So we're almost at the end of the book of Hebrews. And it's been a bit of a long journey, but we are close to the end. And this morning, we're going to ask a couple of questions, but let's just recap what we talked about last week. So last week, I asked you the question, are you a disciple or a convert? Now, the reason I ask this is because a lot of times with Western Christianity, we look for the conversion. Please say the sinner's prayer. Say the sinner's prayer, and once you say the sinner's prayer, you're now a Christian. But what we don't really talk about is the road of development or, or transformation that needs to happen after that moment takes place. And that's what a disciple looks like. And so we talk about what the characteristics of a convert versus a disciple looks like. And I said to you that with a convert, a convert is somebody who has a mental ascent, right? So I'm saying, yes, I want to follow Jesus, or yes, I, I want to try this Christianity thing out, or however you look at it, right? It's very comfortable. Conversion is about this idea of a one-time commitment, but the rest of my life is it's kind of mine. You know, it's, it's kind of mine. Let's not get too crazy here. We talk about this idea of minimum effort, right? I'm going to go to church. Well, when it's not sunny, obviously, because we're Canadians, like you know, we have to take, take advantage of the weather, right? So we, we, we put the most minimum amount of effort forward so that we're just basically saying to ourselves, what do I need to do to get to heaven? Like, how little do I need to do so that I can kind of keep my life but still get that eternal reward? We talk about stagnation. Um, oftentimes, and I've told you this before, I was a youth pastor for two decades, and I remember people saying to me all this, uh, th this stuff that, you know, I'd come home from a retreat with these youth, and the parents would come up to me and go, oh, I remember when. I remember when I used to go on the retreats. I remember when I used to do these things. I'm like, okay, great. But what about now? What about now? What's God doing in your life now? Don't look at 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. What's God doing in your life right now? And we talk about this idea of individual. A convert is really out for themselves. A convert will not really invest in community, will not really take seriously the passages of scripture that talk about the one another. Now contrast that with a disciple. A disciple understands that whatever it is that they are embarking upon, it is a journey. It's a spiritual journey. Right? It's this idea that whatever I am, I can become something different. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, through community, through all these things. But again, it is a journey. We talk about this idea of a disciple reliving a sacrificial life. Right? And with a sacrificial life, when we think about the early church, and again, early church is one of my favorite topics, these individuals, these men and women, realized that whatever they had, whatever they didn't have, whatever capabilities they have, whatever it might be, it was God's. Right? And when you understand that, when that is a primary idea in your head, then all of a sudden everything that you have is yours. You live open-handed. We talk about this idea of lifestyle transformation. Christianity isn't just simply a cognitive idea of like, I believe this worldview, I believe these ascents. It is part that, but it's also as well too that my entire life becomes transformed. Remember, belief informs behavior. Right? What you believe should be lived out by how you behave. You cannot disconnect the two of those. We talk about this idea of growth, and growth is really future. Right? Growth is this idea of not what I am, but what I could be, what I will become. And finally, I would say to you, the disciple is really all about community. So we looked at this idea in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and I kind of broke it down in regards to how the writer of Hebrews talks about it. The writer of Hebrews is really looking at a church, Jewish Christians, right? And these, these Jewish Christians are second generation Christians, and they're making this decision. Is Jesus worth it? Actually, it's a kind of a conversation we all have at different points of our lives. But this early church, these early Jewish Christians were asking themselves this question because the Roman Empire is increasing persecution. And when I say persecution, I mean real persecution. I mean life. I mean property. I mean, you know, being ostracized from community, right? Real persecution. And again, 
People around the world have it. I wouldn't say it's necessarily North American or Westerners, but it is happening around the world in different places. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Middle East, the Chinese underground church, these places, they would absolutely experience first century persecution. For us, persecution is not, we're not allowed to say this or, or we have to do that. That's not really persecution. Because persecution really puts front and center this decision. Is Jesus really worth everything I'm supposed to be giving him? Is he really worth it? And so we talk about this idea about how the writer of Hebrews puts us all together and we say, okay, this is what I need to do for myself. So that's what we looked at uh, last week at the first part of Hebrews chapter 12. This morning, we're going to look at the second part of Hebrews chapter 12. But before we do that, I'm going to talk about an article I came across called, You Must Be Weak to Be Sanctified. Uh, it's a kind of an interesting concept. And uh, Caleb Clark, actually, funny story about this guy named Caleb Clark. His picture makes him look like he's 30, but he writes like he's 50. So you'll, you'll see why in a second. So this is what Caleb Clark says in his article. As we strive in Christ to participate in our sanctification, we become weaker in the worldly sense. We lose our sense of autonomy, independence. We even lose the notion that we can obey God in our own strength, but we gain greater faith, a, gr a glorious dependence on the Spirit, and that's true strength. So what I love about this idea is a couple of concepts. One, participation, right? He, he brings it up right at the very front there and says, listen, whatever sanctification is, and don't worry, we're gonna unpack that word, it actually isn't just simply something that is done, but it's something that we participate in. But the secondary thing I like what he says about it is that in a worldly sense, uh, Christianity, authentic Christianity, properly understood, it should make you weaker. And weaker not in the worldly sense, but weaker in the sense that we don't look at what we have, what we possess, our power, our influence, our affluence. These are not what define us. There are other characteristics, other things that define us. He goes on to say this. What would happen if today's church where to firmly grasp the reality that you must be weak to be sanctified. First, our spiritual pride would be crushed by knowing we walk through the narrow path of sanctification every day, only through the abundant grace of God. We can't brag about our level of spiritual maturity because it's all wrought by grace. Second, our faith would abound. I like this idea when he talks about this spiritual maturity or spiritual growth. You know, I, like, I've said this before, one of my mentors in my life was a guy named Dr. Ron Kidd. He's a professor uh, at my seminary. He went from being a Pentecostal to an Anglican. There's a whole story there as well, too. But uh, he's in his 70s, and I meet with him like, as often as I'm able to. Because of his schedule and my schedule, it's usually about once a year. But every time I meet with him, he's always telling me about you know, a paper he's writing. He still teaches. He still travels. Um, and so I always like, so Dr. Kid, what are you up to right now? I'm like, what are you doing right now? But what I love about what he's saying is that even when I kind of start, you know, fanboying a little bit over it, I'm like, oh, I can't believe you're doing this. Or I can't believe you're meeting with that. He, he often travels to the Vatican to have conversations with some cardinals. That are like, like, yeah, like that's his circles, right? And so what is interesting about Dr. Kidd is I always say, oh, you know, it's just amazing how what you're doing. He's like, you know what? I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm like, dude, come on. Give me some hope here. There's got to be a level where it gets a certain age where I'm like, okay, I can kind of give up here. But he's like in the 70s, like multiple PhDs, again, working papers, presenting papers at councils all around the world, and he's still learning and he's still growing. It's a little bit depressing, but again, it's kind of exciting as well too. This journey that we're on, it's never over, right? Until you take your last breath, you are always going to be this idea of sanctified or growing. And finally, he says this. Our failures and weaknesses often keep us from coming boldly to the throne of grace. By the way, that phrase should jump out at you because, again, the writer of Hebrews uses that exact phrase back in Hebrews chapter 4. Failures are met with, ment uh, with the mental message, just do better. But this understandable response works against the Spirit's sanctifying work because it places the power for change in human hands. Now, here's what's interesting, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, is when we talk about this idea of sanctification or transformation, I've already said to you that this idea of partnership is important. However, we cannot negate the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's power in our life, working in us and through us to accomplish His goal as well. And it's kind of a weird thing because I can't give you a percentage. I can't say it's a 50-50. Because if I'm being kind of honest, sometimes I feel like I'm doing 10% and the Spirit's doing 90%. Right? There's different times in my life, kind of goes back and forth. And again, depends on the context. But he's absolutely right to say that it's not you. Like if I said to you, hey, how do you feel about your Christian life? You're like, well, I just need to pray more. I just need to do this more. I need to have that. These may be true, but that's not necessarily going to get you to what you need to be without 
the power of God, without the presence of God, without the Holy Spirit in you. Yes, that's my Pentecostal side, right? You need that peace or else it's just not gonna be working. If we instead see our weaknesses and failures as invitations to trust God, we're free to face them with a growing faith, knowing God is at work even when we are sinful and weak. It's not as though we, he can't touch our worst. He delights to do so, showing that his strength is perfect even in our weakness. Christian, you must be weak to be sanctified. That phrase, you're a Christian, you know, I only found these people who are, you know, 60, 70 above. And I say 60, I'm close to that now too. So that might be me as well too. But the idea is this. If you want to be sanctified, if you want to be transformed, there's a humility uh, about it. There's a, there is a piece of us that has to go, okay, I need more of, of God in my life. Therefore, I must, I must decrease so that he may increase. So every time we kind of start off with the book of Hebrews, really anytime I teach, I start with a question. And the reason I started with a question is because I want you to kind of invite you into this conversation as opposed to just to dump a whole bunch of information on you. And the question I'm going to ask you this morning is, what gives you security? If I said to you, what's, what gives you your security blanket? Is it your bank account? Well, today, that's, not a lot of people can say that. Is it your education? Is it your relationships? Well, maybe it's, it's your friends or your family. Is it your children? Is it, you know, like what gives you security? Now, fun fact, if you're really being honest, if I, if I connected you to a functional MRI to see when you're really lying or what parts of your brain you're activated, we all have different ones. Like for me, obviously it's my height. Like to be able to dunk on a, on a basketball, you know, that's my level of, I didn't say anything funny. I don't know why you guys are laughing. That's just, that's just rude. No, but everything gives us security. Everything gives us something that we kind of cling to and say, yeah, you know, if God doesn't work out, I got this at least. And the thing is, though, is that we all have them in our lives. Well, the writer of Hebrews this morning is going to use a, a word, and we'll get to it in a second. And he's going to kind of maybe probe into our lives and say, you know what? These things that give you security, the security blanket you think is going to keep you safe, not so much. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different. We're going to take a look at the last section of Hebrews chapter 12. But the first few verses, I'm going to do backwards. We're going to take a look at that at the end instead. Because I think there's going to be a bit of a reveal there, but we're going to get to that. So let's start off at verse 18. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. If you have your Bibles or digital devices, grab them out. Or, as always, they'll be on the screen, so don't worry. Um, so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 to 21 says this. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's commands. Even if, if even an animal touches a mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. Now, Let's just put this into context here. And what's the writer of Hebrews trying to do here? So I've said to you before that the audience the book of Hebrews is being written to is, first of all, is Jewish Christians. Now, when I say a Jewish Christian, those are not antithetical statements. What it means is these are Jewish people who have accepted Christ as the Messiah, right? So we call them Messianic Jews. And so this group of people have decided to follow Jesus. Now, remember, for a Jewish person in the first century to start following Jesus, you have to unpack or unload a lot of Judaism or Jewish tradition because now the Messiah has come. You have to say to yourself, well, what's important what's not important? It's a good question. But remember, this group of Christians is also Greek as well. They're living in a Roman culture, and so they're Jewish living in a Roman culture. And the problem with that is these two ideas are actually, they're kind of butting up against each other. And as I said to you before, is that the Roman Empire, towards the end of the first century, it was increasing persecution. The Neronian uh, persecution, the Diocletian, right? People are literally being killed by the thousands in this time period. So the question they're asking themselves is, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe it's not that worth it. And the final piece of this is a lot of these people that the writer of Hebrews is talking to are second or third generation Christians. Now, for those of you who've been part of the series, you'll know what I'm about to say here. Second and third generation Christians have not fought for their faith. They grew up in it. It was just given to them. And you know that anything you do not fight for, anything that's given to you, you may not hold as closely as you should. So in this room right now, I guarantee you there's second or third or even fourth generation Christians. You grew up in a Christian home. Christianity was just there. 
yeah, I'm a Christian. My parents are Christian. I go to church. I went to Sunday school. You know, what, uh, name whatever you want. It's very rarely that you'll meet somebody that's like, no, no, no. I just came to Christ and like, like, like recently. I'm like, oh, tell me about it. Because when you come to Christ as a first-generation Christian, you have to do something really important. You have to give up stuff. You have to kind of sacrifice stuff. You have to acknowledge that wherever you are is not, in, is not complete. You are incomplete. See, second and third generation Christians, we can kind of trick and fool ourselves to think, yeah, no, 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 I grew up in a Christian home. Thus, I must be a Christian. No greater lie has ever been uh, put forward than that one right there. I grew up in a Christian home. I'm a Christian. No, you're not. You're Christian adjacent or whatever term you want to use. So the second and third generation Christians are people who have said, yeah, I'm a Christian, but not yet have owned it. And as a youth pastor, not now, although I seem like I may act like it, but for two decades when I was a youth pastor, I saw this. I saw these youth come into my ministry, and they would, they would you know, they're, like their parents are like, you know, in the church, I've been in the church. Maybe their parents were like on the board. <laughs> Those kids, ah, anyway, that's a different conversation. But it was always interesting to me when people who didn't go to church came to our youth group. They're like, what is this? Like, how does everyone know these songs? Like, what, like, what's, like what's going on here? And I love talking to those people because they're like, they have a really interesting perspective. Like, that's just kind of weird or, oh, I can't, I get that part, right? But that's actually kind of a more of a fresh way of approaching it. So the reason why the writer of Hebrews comes here, let me bring it back to this, is Mount Sinai to the Jewish people was a very important moment. So the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, is something called the Old Covenant or the Covenant to Jewish people. Mount Sinai was when the law was given. You know, the Ten Commandments, right? Charlton Heston coming down with these big stones there, right? Great gray hair flowing through the back there, right? You know, uh, you know, business at the front, party at the back, kind of mullet kind of thing right there. That was, that was the giving of the law. That's Mount Sinai. But the thing with Mount Sinai is, and again, the writer of Hebrews, like, you know, uh, Caleb spoke a couple of weeks ago. He threw in a lot of uh, Lord of the Rings references. So I don't want to kind of, you know, rain on his, uh, I don't want to trample over what he said there. But the idea behind this is Mount Doom, right? Remember that Return of the King where, you know, the hobbits are sitting there and it's like this volcano is splurring out there. Could you imagine if I said to you, hey, in that place, that's where God is. Go there. I'm like, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Right? Is, there, is there a safer place? There's like a cafe, maybe. I can meet God there. We can have coffee, something like that, right? The reason why the writer of Hebrews is using this kind of imagery is the emotion he's trying to put forward here is fear. Right? Coming to God is fearful. Right? Coming to God is fearful. You know, in the Bible, when we see people encounter God or something supernatural, they're usually kind of terrified. Right? Prophet Isaiah when he sees a vision of God. And whatever that vision looks like, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, I live amongst an unclean people. Right? People lose their minds, and rightfully so, because the supernatural is so different than what we can understand. Well, the writer is saying this to, to the people, because like, he's saying to them, listen, we know that Mount Sinai, God gave us a lot, but was really that kind of God that we want to serve? Is this really the way that we want to approach God? Verse 22 to 24. Now watch the juxtaposition. Now you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have, gone, you have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates a new covenant between God and the people. And to, the, and, 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 and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Now, do you see what he's doing here, right? And, and again, one commentator, Brian Bell, says it this way, right? There's two, there's two images of what the writer's trying to say here. The writer's trying to say to the Jewish Christians, listen, why do you go back to this, this, you know, the old covenant? What does the old covenant have for you that's so appealing? And you see you know, the images, right? Angels singing and joyful, like, if I had to make, say, choose which one, which one are you going to choose? The psychopaths may choose the Mount Sinai one, right? But the rest of the normal people go, no, no, you know what? Mount Zion sounds like a, like, sounds like a cool place. I'd probably have a mall. I'll go there, right? So that's, that's kind of what you see here. Brian Bell says this. The Lord seems to believe in a picture is worth a thousand words. Here the writer downloads two pictures for us, comparing two different mountains, 
two different covenants, two historic people, two important principles. Note all the words that are contrast when we see uh, Sinai, Zev, uh, Zion, heaven, earth, new, old, uh, covenant, uh, uh, old covenant, terror, joy, shake, unshaken, not, to, not come, come, distance, closeness, law at Sinai, grace at glory at Zion. So you see these two pictures he's trying to paint here, right? Because the people are really asking themselves, well, maybe Jesus isn't really that much worth it. Because you have to remember something. The Romans were okay with Judaism. Judaism they understood. Because Judaism, believe it or not, was very similar to Aphrodite, uh, Apollo, all these other kind of Greek religions, right? It had a building. There was, there was you know, sacred things going on there. There were priests. The people understood that. Sacrifice, that all they, all, they, they got that. But this Jesus guy shows up. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, we don't get this. This we don't understand. So it was the persecution they were facing was not because they were Jewish, but because they were Christian. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, we don't know what to do with this. Thus the persecution. Now let's go into our Bibles. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 10 and let's revisit Mount Zion because there's a couple of important things here that we need to remind ourselves to understand what the writer of Hebrews is saying. So Exodus chapter 10, verse 13 um, Actually, I think it might be one to three, but anyways, we'll get that right. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people today and tomorrow, set them apart to be holy. Important phrase. Have them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, people will see the Lord come down on Mount Sinai. Let the people know the places all around that they must not pass. Tell them, be careful that you do not go up on the mountain or touch any place around it. Whoever touches the mountain will be put to death. No hand will touch him, but he will be uh, killed with stones or arrows. If he, if he be animal or man, he will not live. When a long sound from a whore in his herd, they may come up to the mountain. That's terrifying. Right? Like, don't even go clear the mountain. I'm like, okay, can we just put the pylons around the mountain? Because I don't want to get anywhere near that, okay? Can we just get the safety tape out and put that around the mountain? Because this is freaking me out a little bit. Right? But this is how God chose to reveal himself. Now watch this. Verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was a thunder and lightning. A cloud covered the mountain and a very loud horn sounded. All the people among the tents shook with fear. Ding, ding, ding. God's here. Who wants to go meet him? I, I, you know what? I'm okay. Just, just let me know what's going on. I'm okay. Just, just send me an email. Let's text. How about let's, let's create a WhatsApp group on, uh, on God being here. Because really, this does not seem appealing to me. Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord came down upon it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a stove, and the whole mountain shook. Now, I know with all of us today and with Western movies and television, we can have a visual of this, but could you imagine being an ancient people? You'd lose your ever-loving mind right here. Like, just think about this for a moment. An entire mountain is shaking. I've never been to a place with an earthquake. I have been on a mountain, but I will tell you this. If I was on a mountain during an earthquake, it's kind of over, right? It's kind of over. Like, not just a mountain, not just like an earthquake, but together, right? But the reason why the, uh, the writer is using these images, because this is part of the Jewish tradition. However, is this the God that you want to approach? Is this a God you want to draw near to? I would say probably not. Like, I... like. I'm not the kind of person, I, I'm, okay, well, confession time. I, 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 rules are kind of, you know, some can be bent, some can be broken, you know. Little, that, that, by the way, that's my fallen side, just to be clear. That doesn't apply to any of you, right? But with this idea of the mountain, and the fact is that God said to the people, you know what, if someone touches the mountain, don't even kill them with your hand, shoot an arrow at them. All right, start running, right? Like, it's just like, oh, that's terrible. Right? That's horrifying. But this is how God chose to do this. Now, uh, uh, Lisa Neglegev uh, uh, from a Jewish website says this about this, this moment. Receiving the Torah was terrifying. Mount Sinai trembled and the ram's horn blared. Thunder and lightning erupt again and again while smoke billowed out on the mountain like a kiln. I can't help but wonder if all the special effects, I love how she used that phrase, leading up to Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people, is a commentary on the way terror and terrible circumstances push people towards action. Why does God do this? See, this is actually kind of interesting for us, especially as Western Christians, because we have this idea of Jesus as Mr. Rogers. Right? Jesus is, he's cool. He's okay. He's, you know, you know he, he's okay, right? But this God, right? This is why I love when people say, oh, the God of the Old Testament. I'm like, eh, just so you know. 
it's the same, but you know, we can talk about that. Remember what, God, what, what has God done for the people of Israel? First of all, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them in the 10 plagues. You know them in the 10 plagues. I know this as God toppling the different deities of Egypt. Every plague went against the 10 top deities. This is why when you read the Exodus account, you see that priests were trying to counteract Yahweh. So God says this, the priests go, okay, we're going to do this. And God's like, whatever. So the 10 plagues weren't plagues, but these were the 10 ways that God was showing that he was superior to the Egyptian gods. Now, God has taken people through the desert, water splitting, right? Water coming through the rock, you know, bread falling from the sky. By the way, if you're a gluten intolerant, that'd be horrifying, right? You're like, oh, bread everywhere. You're going to run around. <laughs> that's a whole different conversation. But then he finally brings them to the mountain. I know, that's how my brain works. It's, you know, it, it's a busy place. But then he brings them to the mountain. How do you get some pe people's attention after everything you've just done? Right? How do you get people's attention? Now, if you're a parent, or have worked with kids, you know how hard it is to get a kid's attention? Right? It's like, hey, hey, right here, hey, 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 right here, right, right here, right here, right, right, right here, right? God shows up in the way he does, because A, he wants their attention, but he's also saying something to them as well. To be my people, to be set apart, this actually has weight to it. There's consequences to this. This is not just an arbitrary decision that you get to make. If you are a follower of Yahweh, if you're a follower of Christ, to be sanctified, to be set apart, it's just not a kind of a, yeah, I just say the sinner's prayer and you're going to be okay. There's actually consequences to this. Let's go on. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 25 to 27, the writer says this. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that the only unshakable thing will remain. There's three ideas here. I'm going to come back to it towards the end here. But you see what he's saying, right? Like, this is kind of a remarkable statement. He's saying, listen, if the people of Israel had no choice but to go, wow, God is there. And then could you imagine refusing that God? See, it's interesting as a Christ follower, um, we don't see Jesus. We just accept Jesus. We don't see God, we just accept God. Therefore, it's kind of an abstraction to be a Christ follower because we don't really see whom we are serving. However, we see it maybe in community and scripture and all, and that's true. But really, you can kind of go, well, you know, God's up there somewhere, as if he's up there somewhere, as opposed to everywhere. But the point is, we have a way of kind of deluding ourselves that God's not with us. Well, the writer of Hebrews is crying something out here. To the people of Israel at the time, that wasn't the case. Verse 20 to 29, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping with holy fear and awe, for our God is a devouring fire. And in this particular case, I'm going to say that I like the King James Version, consuming. I like that word, consuming. Now, there's a reason it says that. Now, uh, commentary looking here on this says this, drawing comparisons between the new covenant and the old covenant constitutes one of the foundational strategies that the offer of Hebrews employs to convince us to hold on to Christ. If I said to you, sure, you can reject Jesus. Now here's the 613 rules that you need to follow. Here's the sacrifices. And by the way, forgiveness, you got to kill something. So you can have that or Jesus. You choose. Right? So what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is that, listen, you can do whatever you want. You can follow the old ways. You can follow the old covenant. But Jesus is just better. He's more complete. It's all, it's all right there in the package. Now, let's go to the first part. And before I get to the first part, I came across a Puritan pastor by the name of Thomas Brooks. This is a quote from 1662. Yes, I do my research. Look what he says about this verse of scripture we're about to read. If I were the fittest man in all in the world to preach a sermon to the whole world, gathered together in one congregation, and if I had some high mountain for my pulpit, from whence I might have a prospect of all the world in my view, and if I were furnished with a voice of brass, a voice as loud as the trumpet of the archangel, and all the world might hear me, I would choose to preach on no other text than Hebrews 12, 14. 
Obviously, they don't have, you know, AV systems at this time. You, you get the idea, right? But you see what he's saying here. He says, if I only get to what, preach one sermon to every in the world, it's about the passage of scripture you're about to read here. So I, I say that to you because as we approach this scripture, I want you to see how important this is to what he understood. But I would say to you, even to us today. So Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 17. We started off at the mountain, but then let's go back ahead before that and take a look here. Look what the writer of Hebrews says. Work at living in peace with everyone. And work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as a firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. Let's unpack this, these, these verses. And again, let's, let's think to ourselves of Thomas Brooks, the uh, Puritan pastor, and saying, you know what? If I only had one verse, this is it here. This is what I would tell everybody. Because I would say to you that this is kind of coming to the culmination of everything the writer of Hebrews has been trying to put together for us. He's taken 11 chapters previous to this to kind of really unfold his argument for Jewish Christians. But I would say to you as well, even though you can say to yourself this morning, and I, 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 I don't know everyone's ethnicity, but we're not Jewish Christians. But we are Christians of two worlds. We are Christians that are probably second or third generation. We are believers who are asking ourselves, is Jesus worth it? And I don't know your stories. I don't know where you're at right now. But again, this question is, is Jesus worth it? It's not one time. Things come up in our lives relationships, tragedies, suffering, uh, it, prosperity. Prosperity tests this theory in our lives more than you understand. All these things ask, make, make us ask the question, is Jesus worth it? So let's unpack this a little bit and kind of see what he's kind of getting at here. So the first thing we'll know is the word he uses for work. It's a Greek word that basically means to press hard after. Pursue with earnestness and diligence in order to obtain, to go after with desire of obtaining. This command to pursue peace and holiness suggests several thoughts. One, this is not optional. Okay? That's, that's a really important part. The, the, the tense of the Greek word that he uses is a command. It's not like, hey, you know what? If people don't bug you, if they're kind of like you, yeah, pursue, you know, pursue uh, uh, peace with them. You know, it's interesting. I was having a conversation. We were, we were talking out uh, in the atrium, a few of us, and we were talking about this idea of how the world sees, you know, diversity and inclusion. Everyone talks about it, but what they don't tell you is diversity and inclusion only applies to people who agree with what we agree with. It doesn't really apply to people who don't think like us, which is kind of funny because the dictionary t definition is actually a little bit different than that, but that's a different story. So the writer of Hebrews is not saying, hey, by the way, Christian, you know, you go to a church and there's some annoying people. You know that person who, who, you know, probably sings off key or that person doesn't know how to clap properly or, you know, that individual who, you know, whatever it might be. Those people just try to avoid. But the people you like, pursue peace with them. Pursue them because they're, you know, they're your kind of people. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, you know what, no matter who they are, what they are, what they look like, socioeconomic, whatever you might be able to put to there, they're part of this. Um, he says, secondly, to pursue demands diligence and a directed effort. So you don't have the choice. You, know, you don't have the choice. It's not like, hey, you know, I get to avoid this person because they're weird. But you, if they are Christ followers, are commanded to pursue them. And this pursuit is not to be a spasmodic endeavor, but it is to be a lifelong task. Those who are at peace with God, the inverse is also true, are responsible to pursue peace in their relationship with others as an important aspect of growth. You know, those people who don't really get along well with others, we all know them. We probably work with them, might even be married to them, might even be, you know, in your family members. Again, whatever classification you want to put there, you're kind of hoping that eventually, you know, it's nice to get along too, right? Less conflict. Well, could you imagine the early church Slaves, slave owners, like, like ethnicities diverse as you could imagine, and people coming from different backgrounds, different religions. How do these people get along? Right? Could you imagine being, um, I, I was thinking about this the other day, could you imagine being in a church where you are owned by somebody as a slave? Now, 
That image and that idea is horrifying for us, rightfully so. But looking across the aisle, if such an aisle existed, there's a owner over there. And you know how much your owner hurts and degrades you and abuses you? And then across the aisle there is a person who is in that class of individuals? How do you get along with them? How do you kind of say, you know what? i got to pursue peace with these individuals as well. Now, the word peace is actually kind of interesting. Now, in to, the, to the Jewish part, it's shalom. Now, what you may not know about the word shalom, though, is it's not just simply, hey, peace. There's actually a bit more to it than that. Peace actually means, it's actually the foundational word for this idea of reconciliation. So peace isn't just, hey, be peaceful, add peace. Peace, brother. For those of you who might be a little bit older, hey, peace, right? What they're actually saying is let's take two things that are broken and let's knit them back together. It's the foundational word for humanity and God's relationship. Humanity has been broken away from God, so peace actually knits them back together. This is why Paul uses the phrase, he is our peace, because he's trying to tell us something. It's not just simply about, oh, let's, let's just get along, right? Let's just be peaceful. But it's actually saying, you know what? These two things, these two people, these two types of groups of people, they're in conflict with each other. Peace, to pursue peace, means not just to avoid conflict. Avoidance is a great way of avoiding conflict, for sure, but the conflict is still there innerwise. But what he's actually saying is you actually have to find a way to knit two things that are broken together. That's true peace as the Bible describes it. And what's interesting about that is I was having this conversation with a, a coworker at my other job, and we were talking about how everyone's just mad at each other. Everyone's mad at each other today, right? This, per, this group's had a, mad with this group, and this group's mad with that group, and that group can't get along with this group, and this group just wants to. And again, they're not wrong, right? The level of anger and escalation are, in, our, in our culture is, is astonishing. And again, mental health professionals all over the place just like are picking up on it. I'm like, I don't know why. I know why. Because people aren't really pursuing peace. And peace is more than just simply going, you know what, this is what's different about us. So back uh, in the pandemic, we know that churches and Christians... How do I say this gently? We just didn't get along very well. Christians really chose stances upon things that really weren't biblical or what I would say are salvific, but seemed to get dragged into the center of the gospel. And I said to you guys at UCC, A, we're not a political church. Don't care who you vote for. And we're not a church that says, hey, you have to do this to be, in order to be a Christ follower. Because really, the Bible tells us what be a Christ follower. That's, that's Christ. It's kind of in the title. And so what happened was, is there's a lot of conflict in the church, and we're still seeing that right now. There's a lot of splintering going on. A lot of, a lot of self-selection. And I find it astonishing because Christians should know better than anybody else. This is what makes us Christ followers. And all this other stuff, meh, whatever. But this, this is, this is immovable. This is foundational. This stuff here, you know. Like, if you like hockey, yeah, I'm okay with that. I, I'll never watch a hockey game. I'll never go to a hockey game. But if you like it, that's okay. But if I said to you, true Christ followers like basketball, that might be overstepping my bounds, right? And then if I said to you, if you like basketball, you have to like the Toronto Raptors since day one. That, again, might be overstepping my bounds. What am I doing? It's, you're chuckling, and I don't know why you're chuckling, but you're chuckling because what I'm basically saying is I'm applying a secular or societal concept to what is, again, the gospel, and you can't do that. So when we talk about this idea of peace, please understand, it's not just like, a, hey, man, peace. But it's actually, no, 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 no. You have to find a way to understand what is important and what is unimportant. And this is the problem with our society. Everything, the unimportant has become vastly important. Thus the reason why the escalation of conflict. Our A. Tori says this. Here we are taught that we have our own part in sanctification. Uh, and that if we are to be sanctified in the fullest sense, sanctification is something that we must pursue or seek earnestly if we are to obtain it. While sanctification is God's work, we have our part in it to make, the, to make it the object of our earnest desires and eager pursuit. So we've been talking about sanctification. I've talked about the term a little bit. But when we talk about this idea of pursuing peace, when we talk about this idea of getting together and all that, 
It's a part of our process of becoming something different. It's part of our process of saying, you know what? It's not just simply about what label I apply to myself. I have to look at somebody and see they're different than me and go, okay, apart from the differences that I see, what really makes us have common commonality? What makes us have relationship? And that should be Jesus. Sanctification is not simply something to be done to us, but something we choose to participate in. Now, this is important. When I, when I was younger, I thought the idea of sanctification, first of all, I didn't know what that meant. But then when people say, oh, it's to be holy. Well, when I was younger, I thought only old people could be holy. And that's until I became a pastor and realized that's not the case. Old or young, relax. But the point simply is this. I thought holy meant somebody who was like, you know, mature and, and all that. But I have found, much to my, my surprise, or maybe not surprise, is that it doesn't matter what your age is. Maturity does not benefit basically whether you have hair or gray or not or whatever. Maturity is something different. Sanctification is something different. So let me give you a definition of the word sanctification. The word that he uses here is consecration, purification, dedication. Fun fact, whenever a word has a T-I-O-N, shun on it, it becomes a process. Okay? Now, this is important. The reason why this is important is because um, when you first become a Christ follower, if you really authentically approach this idea, then you realize there's a part of my life that cannot continue along this way. See, what is happening within Christianity right now is a lot of negotiation. And by negotiation, what I mean is people going, well, I want to be a Christ follower, but I want to keep this. I want this to be a part of my life. And it's kind of like, well, this actually is kind of what God doesn't want you to keep part of your life. Well, you know what? I'm going to ignore the Old Testament then. And you know what? I like the red letters of Jesus. We, we kind of start editing the Bible to suit whatever it is that we think that we're allowed to keep. And again, I understand, I, I understand the impulse. Why? I want to be comfortable. I don't want to have this part of me that gets convicted for the sin and the behavior that I do. So we case for ourselves, okay, sanctification is to be separate. Now, let me show you what I would call the choice of sanctification. I was going to call it the process, but that's it's kind of redundant. I'm going to use the writer of Hebrews. Remember I said to you before, we're going to take a look at the three ideas, shake, shaken, and unshakable. When the writer of Hebrews uses the word shake, I would say to you that when we talk about this idea of sanctification, we talk about this idea of holiness, one of the issues with holiness is that I, I think... As Western Christians, I don't think we're afraid of sin anymore, and I'll unpack that in a second. The second part of shaken, right? God tests us to see what we're holding on to. And finally, the last part of it is unshakable is we are partners in this process. So let me talk about shake for a second. Austin Lundstrom says this, Dr. Jerry Bridges, a beloved and recently deceased Christian author and speaker, wrote a book called Respectable Sins. By the way, great title, that highlights the issues of modern-day Christians tolerating sin, which puts us at arms, at, at, at arms with God. He says, but on the whole, we appear to be more concerned about the sins of society than the sins of the saints. In fact, we often indulge in what I call respectable or even acceptable sins without any sense of sin. Now, just the fact that I'm using sin means I must be archaic as a pastor. Because there's lots of other words we can use for sin, and I have used them before. Brokenness, fallenness, darkness, these are all true. But let's just call it what it is, what the Bible says. It's sin. Now, please understand something. There's things that Christians have called sin that are actually not sin. And there's things that Christians have kind of, kind of ignored but really are sin. For an exhaustive list, go to Romans chapter 1. Point is this. What Christians have done over the last little bit, and by I say a little bit, I mean the last 100 years, is we are so easy to point out society's problems, and our church has become very toxic. Christians have been very toxic. The behavioral changes that should happen in Christ's lives are not. Why? Because we're so busy pointing out other people's problems and not really kind of um, seeing theirs. So in my other job, I actually, um, <laughs> I don't know if it's a promotion as much of a demotion, but I became the trainer of the stores. Now I train people on how to do what they're supposed to do. What's interesting about being a trainer with people is anybody, if, if you ever coached or trained somebody, you know this, right? Because everyone has a very, has an idea of what they are, right? You know, I never watched American Idol, except for the first couple of weeks. 
because my favorite person was Simon Cowell. And the reason I like Simon Cowell so much is because, and you, you know that the producers of the show are totally setting this up, right? You, would ha- you see this conversation with a person who's coming forth to kind of be a part of this program. And the person would say something like this. I love singing. I've been singing my entire life. My family loves it when I sing. I sing all the time. And they're like, okay, great. Sing for us. And they're tone deaf. And, you know, the other judge is like, well, you know, I, I, I see a lot of passion there. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I really love, love your hair. You know, it's fantastic, right? But then Simon comes along and goes, okay, you should never sing again. As a matter of fact, you should just never think about ever singing ever again. Now, why I like that is because sometimes we don't have people in our lives tell us the truth. So as a trainer, I get to come along to people, and, and people are like, oh, I'm really good at this. I'm like, well... Just so you know, you're not. Let's just work on this part. What are you talking about? Now, the cool thing is I actually have, I, I, we have metrics. And so I'm able to kind of say, hey, let's take a look at these. And I'll show you why all your customers rate you really badly. As a matter of fact, one person said this about you, right? So we, we get that. Point is this. We talk about this idea of, of being afraid to sin. Well, the reason I bring it up is when we think about this idea of holiness, if we already think we're holy, then what, where's the transformation? Do we have it all together? And we just kind of ignore. So oftentimes Christians will say, and I think this might be the next quote. Okay, yeah, this is the next quote here. A lot of words. Don't worry, I'm going to read it for you. Robbie F. Castleman says this. I often hear Christians summarize salvation as Jesus saved me from my sins. They will then summarize the sins as a list of things I've done wrong. Embedded in this anemic understanding of salvation is an estimation of oneself that really is not bad at all, or at least isn't as bad as a lot of other people. Pause. What do we do as Christians? We look at other people and go, well, I'm not that. But then we ignore what needs to be done in our own lives. Let me go on. Christians are so glad they are saved from their sins when we look at really rotten people on TV or read about them in the newspaper and think to ourselves, how can someone do something like that? I can't imagine. Well, that's the problem. Why can't we imagine ourselves as equally rotten, as just as sinful? Apart from God's grace in our lives, these people are you and me. And that's true because sin isn't just bad stuff we do, and that's not the problem Jesus saves us from. No, Jesus has, in fact, saved us who we are. The problem is our sin nature, and this is not what we do, but who we are. When Christians reduce salvation to sin management and living self-controlled lives, the Savior becomes just a part of self-esteem therapy, and grace is swallowed like a happy pill. That's a real ouch moment, right? But see, this is the problem. If I say to you, right, you're a sinner, you're like, yeah, these are things I do. I'm like, no, 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 no. Forget the stuff you do. You are a sinner. This is not just a declaration of your behavior. This is a declaration of what you are. Your response, my response is, yes, I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's the difference between me and the rest of the world. See, it's easy, especially with social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Snap, whatever. Live your best life. Point is this. It's so easy to look at the world and see how bad other people are. But in that is this idea that, well, I'm better than that. If you think you're better than that, then what work will you do to actually become more like Jesus? Because if all you're doing is comparison, pretty good. I have this conversation all the time. I'm not a bad person. I haven't killed anyone. Spectacular. But Jesus had the same conversation with a rich young ruler. Good teacher, what must I do to be saved? Jesus gives him kind of like a little like, you know, don't steal, don't kill. Like, ah, yeah, I've done it, I'm good then. But Jesus saw him, and I love Mark's version. Mark says, and loved him, agape him. Sell everything you have and follow me. So, so mean. But what's he trying to say to him? Yeah, this behavioral stuff you've got, but the thing that really owns your heart is your possessions. See, what gave that young man security to say that, make that statement? His wealth. That might be the problem. Shaken. Exodus chapter 20, verse 20 to 21. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you and so may have enough fear of him to keep you from sinning. The people stood far away and Moses came near to the cloud where God was. So Moses understood what the people didn't understand. Is that yes, God shows up in this incredibly horrifying way. 
But the question was, are you willing to pursue Yahweh in spite of this? Jesus does the exact same thing in John chapter 6. Jesus says to his disciples, and remember, Jesus didn't have 12 disciples. I tell you this before, and I'll tell you again. He had 72. And by the way, Jesus didn't believe in church growth. Why? Because in John chapter 6, 60 of them are going to leave. You know why? Because Jesus says this to them. He says this to them. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't follow me. Ugh. Yeah, I'm out of here. I'm not in the cannibalistic cult, so I'm done. And then Jesus turns and sees the 12 standing there. And Jesus is like, well, why haven't you guys left? Again, Peter, who gets some things right and gets other things really badly wrong, says, you're the only one who has words of life. In other words, Jesus, we know you don't want us to eat people, so what exactly are you saying? Right? The mountain, shaking, all that, but is God worth the pursuit? Martin Luther says it this way, I have held many things in my hands and have lost them all. But whatever I placed in God's hands, that I still possess. That's good stuff. That's tattoo worthy. Don't recommend it, but that's good. What gives you security? What gives you safety? What gives you something that gives, makes, makes you feel good about yourself? Well, I'm going to tell you this right now. At some point in time, the world will shake it. It will be shaken from you. And I've seen this. Loss of relationship, loss of health, loss of life, loss of finances, loss of job. Pick whatever loss you want. You'll be shaken at that moment. And in that moment, based upon your reaction, what you thought would give you safety is being revealed. Your heart is being revealed in its rawest form. And I want you to understand something. I don't want that for you, but I do want that for you because that's when truth comes. That's when the reality of the situation actually is part of it. Now let's talk about unshakable. The Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, by the way, horrible name, they have to work on their branding, but they actually have a good thing to say here. The generic meaning of sanctification is a state of proper functioning. To sanctify someone or something is set that person or thing apart for the use intended by its designer. A pen is sanctified when used to write. Eyeglasses are sanctified when, they, they, when used to improve sight. In the theological sense, things are sanctified when they're used for the purposes of God intends. A human being is sanctified Therefore, when he or she lives according to God's design and purpose. Now, the reason I point that out to you is that sanctification isn't something done for you. It's something you participate in. Now, I'm going to go in a little bit deeper into the Greek language here for a second because the writer of Hebrew uses this, but I need to point it out for you because it's kind of important. Uh, Matthew S. Harmon says this, In sanctification, both God and Christian have specific responsibilities. Paul commands believers to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. By the way, there's a certain theological group of Christians who hate that statement. Work out? How can I work out? It's already given to me. I was predestined. That's not me. I may have revealed who I thought those people were, but that's a different story. For it is God who works in you both to will and work for his good pleasure. God is the one who does the work of making us more like Christ. And we participate in that work by a life of continually turning away from sin and demonstrating our faith in Christ by obeying God's commands. The Holy Spirit plays a key role in this process. As we walk in the power of the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What's he saying here? Sanctification isn't, you're sanctified. You're a Christian, you're set apart. Mm. You are set apart, and the process of that being set apart is being lived out in your, life, in your daily life. Sinclair Ferguson, by the way, cool name, Sanctification is by no means a mystical experience in which holiness is ours effortlessly. God gives increase in holiness by engaging our minds, wills, and emotions and actions. We are involved in the process. That is why biblical teaching on sanctification appears in both the indica uh, indicative, uh, I sanctify you, and the imperative, sanctify uh, yourselves this day. Now, I want to unpack what he's talking about here. In the Greek, there's two tenses. Well, actually, there's more than that. But the two tenses that are used here is one that is completed for you, when you have a process. And fun fact, sanctify is actually used in the other way. Let me show you. Uh, again, this is, we're getting a little technical, but I want you to understand what's going on here. This reflects the standing state relationship in which we often speak about. While we have a perfect standing in Christ because of what he's done for us, we must still, we must still work on our actual state. So let me pause there before going any further. When you become a Christ follower, you move from the camp of the enemy to a friend of God. That's the state, okay? But the process of that is a continually daily, and as Paul says, taking up our crosses. 
So it's, it's already done for us, but there is continual work that needs to be happening as well. He goes on to say this. Our standing is in the indicative, which is our state, of, and our state is imperative. I know. This also is reflected in the justification-sanctification relationship. Freely, by God's grace, we are justified complete in God's sight when we become Christians. And to that we say, amen. But, but, the rest of Christian life involves a process of sanctification where we become more and more like Christ. Justification is the indicative of declaring righteousness, while sanctification is the imperative making righteous. We are to become what we are, and that's it right there. Right? We must become what we are. So when the writer of Hebrews is talking this idea of being holy, he's not saying you're holy and set apart. He's saying you're holy and set apart, and now God gets to use you for whatever purpose he's designed you for. That's the process of sanctification. That's the unshakable part of it. Let me close. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 10. Paul captures this a little bit, and he says it this way. I once thought these things were valuable. Now, let me just tell you what these things are. Paul was a Pharisee of high standing. He came from a family of wealth, because really to be a Pharisee meant to be wealthy as well, too. Paul says, you know what? These are the things that gave me security. These are the things that gave me worth. These are the things that defined who I was. And he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what, of, because of what Christ has done. Now, see the juxtaposition here. I asked you at the very beginning of our time together, and you're like, I can't even remember. What gives you security? What gives you your sense of worth? What gives you your sense of pride? Stuff you own, people you know, relationships, jobs, health, whatever it might be. And Paul says, you know what? I used to think these were valuable, but now they're worthless. Yes, everything else is worthless than compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded, being sanctified, everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Now, why does he use that little last sentence there? We serve, for lack of a better way of saying it, we serve an invisible God. When the Bible tells us it is by grace we are saved, when John's gospel tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all righteousness, I just need you to know something. That is a 100% act of faith. To believe that you are forgiven from what you believe is unforgivable, to be forgiven from your habitual sins, which you consistently do, to be forgiven for the things that you do, the things you think, the things that you are. Again, remember I said to you this phrase before, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. In our sins, we are dead. Full stop, we are dead. Christ came to make us alive. And that life, and again, John's gospel, life abundantly, that's by faith. Only way I can say to you that I'm a Christ follower is not because of stuff I do, because that stuff's not that great. It's by faith in what Jesus has done. Remember, I become what I am. To Jesus, I'm a child of God. But in process, by sanctification, I become that child by submitting to him, by living sacrificially, by allowing myself to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, conviction and all the other stuff there, so that I can actually attain what he has for me. I work out my salvation with fear and trembling. And if you knew me, the fear and trembling is absolutely appropriate. This is what it means to be a Christ follower. And this is why Paul adds that line at the end, by faith. The writer of Hebrews wants his audience to understand something. Wherever you've come from, whatever you think is important, whatever gives you security, whether it's Judaism, the sacrifice system, our ancestry, Mount Sinai, all these things become worthless next to who? The Messiah who is. We boldly come to the throne of grace. Again, the writer of Hebrews has said that phrase already. That's what it means to think of our past as say to ourselves, you know what? I'm working on it, but I'm being worked on as well. 
I'm submitting to it, and I'm being obedient to what God says. I'm not editing God so that he matches up what I think is righteous. I'm saying I'm seeing his word as being true and submitting myself to it. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We do this every week. I'm not going to make you do anything, but I am going to ask you a question. Holiness isn't just simply about something you are, but it's something you are becoming. It's not just simply about saying, you know what, I'm holy because I'm a Christ follower. And again, when you think back to when you made that decision, when you made that declaration, realize that there should be movement since that time. There should be growth, maturity, and yes, failure. This is all part of the discipleship process. You're not holy as a label, but you're being made holy, which is, again, participation with what God wants. I don't expect any of you to get it right, but I do expect all of us to look at our past and say, well, I used to think this was valuable, but now it's garbage. Compared to what? Knowing Jesus. The only way a person can say that is that that same person understands that what we have in this life, what we experience in this life is temporary. It's the life after this life which is the most important. The entirety of your physical life is basically one long test. Every day we take up our cross. Every day we say to God, your will, or we say to God, my will. And that's it. This is an act of faith. It's an act of obedience. It's an act of sanctification. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you saw us and loved us, not as we are, but as we could be. Lord, I pray for each person in this room. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would, in Jesus' name, speak to us, reveal to us, help us to understand that the things we think give us control, things that give us security, Lord, these things are okay, but as Paul says, they're worthless. Why? Because when we know Jesus, we have everything we need. We have everything that we need. Why? Because this life is temporary, and the next life to come is the life that we are really aiming for. Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would sanctify us and that we would participate in choice, in submission, in sacrifice to what that is. God, I thank you. I thank you that you've provided this way. Lord, I don't go back to my old ways. I don't go back to my own sin management days of where I thought of myself as a sinner because of what I've done. But instead, I, instead I grasp a hold of Jesus. And I say, I'm being a sinner saved by grace, being transformed by the Spirit, moving towards Christ-likeness. Sometimes small steps, sometimes large steps, but either way, forward towards Jesus. Spirit of the Most High God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. Amen.